All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Hong Tu Church, where we are talking about the playbook. We lost the camera. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so, if you didn't notice, we've been in the last couple of weeks talking about this series called the playbook, and we have we've had some wonderful messages. Let's be honest. We started out two weeks ago with Pastor Andrew, absolutely killed it. Gave us the opening to what our series really is talking about. Our whole basis for our playbook is faith. And then when Pastor Sacha, she came up just a week ago and talked about why we need to be baptized and she absolutely killed it when it came to the basics of our faith but I'm excited today because I get to talk about the first of our offensive plays that we get to run in our playbook you see in any sports kind of realm you're gonna have plays that you run in order to score and I'm excited that I get to share the first of these plays now if you know anything about American football, and I played American football, I played football in high school, I was a defensive lineman, and one of the things that I was always coached on was the fact that defense wins games. And if you've ever heard that before, you could probably agree with it, except I'm going to tell you right now that it's wrong. Defense wins half of your games. Offense wins the other half. And today we're going to learn about the first of our offensive plays that sets a foundation for all the other plays in our playbook that we get to run. Now, this first play that we get to run is com entirely comprised of a word called prayer. And for most of us sitting here, we've probably heard somebody say the word prayer. We've probably sat at a table with somebody who maybe has prayed before a meal, or maybe we grew up in church and we heard people praying on a Sunday. But how many of us actually know what prayer is? What its definition is? What it means to pray in its power? Because prayer is the easiest and most effective play we can run in our grudge match against the armies of hell, against the forces of evil on the other team. So let's start with the basics. Let's start with our playbook basics and start with prayer. So what is prayer? Well, in my searching on how to define prayer, I came to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary and I saw that our kind of secular term for prayer is, in all lack of a better term, it's a conversation between us and God. And that's not wrong. Don't get, don't get me wrong. That's not an incorrect definition of prayer. I mean, prayer at its basic core is a conversation that we have between us and God. However, it doesn't feel full. It doesn't feel like we can just run a play called prayer and it just be, oh, we have a conversation with God and we're going to score in the end zone. It's not happening. So we have to look into the Bible. What does the Bible say about prayer? And I was searching in the Old Testament for how they define prayer. And when I looked at the word prayer in Hebrew, it means to interpose or intercede. And I was like, well, what do those really mean? Because I've used those words before, but what does it mean? And so when I looked at it, the words basically mean in English to stand in between. Whether it's in between two people because they're fighting and we're standing in the middle saying, hey, calm down, calm down. Or maybe it's there's two events, one of them we're running and one of them we have to be a part of and we're stuck in the middle. But what does it mean to be in the gap? Because the Hebrew definition of us being in the gap is that we're in between God and humanity. And that prayer is this gap that we stand. But that doesn't sound quite right either. So if you would, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 with me. Because I want to give you guys the definition of prayer that the Bible has for us. In 1 Timothy 2, it says this about prayer. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind. Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. You see, the issue with the Hebrew definition of prayer is that it doesn't have Jesus. 
But our definition of prayer today is that Jesus stood in the gap for us. He was the mediator, the one who prayed for us in the gap. And his work on the cross closed the gap between us and the Father, between humankind and God. So that's our definition of prayer. But what does it mean to pray? And we're going to get into that today. So there's two different types of prayer that we're going to talk about in our sermon today as we're here. The first type is going to be communal prayer. And communal prayer is exactly what it sounds like. It's the prayer of a community. Communal meaning community, prayer being prayer. But what does that really mean? If you turn with me to Mark, by the way, we're going to be flipping a lot. If you turn with me to Mark 14, we're going to see an example of what communal prayer actually is, and then we're going to talk about it. Mark chapter 14, verse 32 says this. They, meaning Jesus and the disciples, went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And then he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And then going a little farther, he threw himself to the ground and began to pray. And if we continue down to verse 38, it says this. When Jesus returned from his prayer, he found Peter asleep. And he says to Peter this. Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into a time of trial. So what's happening here? Because... Nowhere once does it say within this passage, communal prayer. It says prayer a couple of times, but that's about it. Well, this passage isn't talking about communal prayer. It's setting up what communal prayer is. You see, Jesus, in his greatest time of need, brought together his community of people, his disciples, to pray. Why would Jesus keep them awake? I mean, he, he brought James and Peter and John and then said, I'm going to leave you right here so I can go pray. It's not like he needed protection. He leaves them anyway. He keeps them awake because he needs them to pray. The power of communal prayer, the purpose of communal prayer, is that there is strength in numbers. There's strength in a number of people praying. And when you have multiple people praying for the same thing, the power is only magnified. It doesn't mean the power is not there in the individual, but... The power of each individual is magnified. And Jesus reflects this again in Matthew. If you go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 18, it's one of the most misquoted pieces of scripture, but it says this, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there also. And while that scripture may be talking about when you bring somebody up for their sins in good faith, what it's talking about is the fact that where there is community, there is power to transform. Where there is community, where there is prayer, there is power. So community prayer, communal prayer, is done in power with number. But then what does that say about the second form of prayer, individual prayer? You see, the second form of, it, of prayer is this individual prayer, but what we just talked about is that we need numbers in order to pray, but... Now you're telling me we got to pray individually? It seems kind of backwards, but in reality, Jesus models individual prayer more than anybody. If you look in Luke chapter 6, Jesus says this, that, but now more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and be cured of their diseases, but he withdrew to deserted places to pray. Jesus withdrew to deserted places to pray in the middle of healing and curing people. But why? It's because Jesus knew that there is power in the secret. There's power in the intimate. There's power in the relational relationship between us and God. Jesus spent his entire earthly ministry here on earth for the sole purpose of dying on a cross so that we may have right relationship with God. Jesus didn't die on a cross for our community of people to be praying all at once. And while he did die for us as a community, he died for us as individuals. He died that we may have individual prayer time with God, individual relationship. You see, our definition of prayer 
is not just communal, it's not just individual, it's relational. Mm, that's good. All of prayer is relational. It's the purpose of it. Jesus even echoes this in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says that in order to pray, don't heap up empty praises, but instead, whenever you pray, go to your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. Pray who is in secret. So that begs the question, how do we do it? How do we pray in the community and how do we pray in the individual? And the simple answer is this. Jesus taught us. In that same Matthew 6 passage, he says this. Pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And many of us know how we end it currently, but the passage ends in that manner. You see, Jesus is not giving us this prayer as the end-all, be-all of prayers. It's actually our guideline. It starts with opening up the Father towards us, saying, Father, who art in heaven, hear me. Your name is hallowed. Come to me and let's speak. And then it asks for a communal prayer. God, have your kingdom come and do what only your kingdom can do. We as a community need our community to pray. We need help in our community, in our world. And then it goes into the individual saying, I need my daily bread. Individually, God, you know what I need in my heart. You know what I desire. Give me today what I need. And then it ends with asking for protection from evil. It's not the end-all, be-all, it's the model. And you can fill in those blanks with whatever you need or whatever your community needs, but that's the basic prayer. So how do we run our play? This first offensive play of our series, it's really simple. It starts by knowing the play. We know the name, it's prayer. And this play is twofold. It starts with a community on one side, a community of people pushing one way, and suddenly, around the other side comes the individual with the ball. See, the community doesn't have to get all the way to the end. The individual does. The only person who matters in the play is the one with the ball. And that's each and every one of us. Our community supports the individual as they run towards the end zone. And the enemy will be fooled every time because they go towards the mass. Forget about the one. And so if you've never had the opportunity to sit here and say, I've had a relationship with Jesus that allows me to pray both in a community and for myself individually, I ask you just to sit here and say this with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy world be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for forever and ever. Amen.